History is a contested battlefield and no more so than in a country that has the shadow, even today, of colonization. I'm Barkhadat Yo with the Mojo Story. On the program today, we'll be meeting a very, very interesting writer and thinker of our times. Dr. Vikram Sampath, whose earlier work on Veer Savarkar triggered, in some ways, a national debate, is now out with a new book, a book in which he is chronicling the stories of people he calls the brave hearts of Bharat. It is a counter view, a counter perspective to, way, to the way many of us have learned our history in our schools and our colleges, choosing to shine a light on unsung heroes. Let's introduce our newsmaker on the program today, Dr. Vikram Sampath. Always a pleasure to see you, Vikram. Um, I, you know, it's a fascinating book, but we've had different counters in the history of history to mainstream telling of what happened in the past. Subaltern uh, School of History, for example, tried to tell the story of um, our country and our world from the grassroots up. When you talk about Brave Hearts of Bharat, and we'll get to the book in just a moment, you chose to say Bharat, not India. That's the first thing that struck me. Talk a little bit about why Bharat, not India, and what you see as the difference between the two. Thank you, Barkha. Always a pleasure talking to you. And I don't think any uh, book tour is complete without our conversation. That's quite mandatory. Absolutely. <laughs> so I don't want to create this false, uh, you know, divide and fight between India and Bharat that is usually done. I think India, that is Bharat, as our constitution also begins. I think these are two different, uh, I mean, the same, two sides of the same coin. In fact, the subtitle of my book is Vignettes from Indian History. Uh, but, you know, the, the very fact that the book, uh, as I've outlined, is about, uh, you know, civilizational resistance. It's, a, it's not about, um, you know, just individuals who represent a larger civilization which did not, as is popularly, uh, you know, believed and agreed, covered in front of every person who came and invaded our shores. Of course, we lost, uh, you know, several battles and so on. But then a great amount of resistance and valor and courage was also demonstrated by our ancestors. So when, when we talk of a, the civilizational idea of this nation, uh, I think Bharat is how our ancestors mm -hmm kind of always imagined and saw this uh, landmass uh, right from that, uh, you know, uh, shloka of the Vishnu Puran, which talks about this entire landmass south of the Himalayas and uh, north of the seas as being Bharat and uh, its children being Bharatiyas. So I thought that was a very evocative because the name comes with a lot of subtlety to it. Uh, there's a lot of context. There's a lot of richness of history and understanding to it. Uh, though for me, I don't see this, uh, you know, as a divide between two, uh, in, uh, two names. One of the other things you've said is uh, that there is a kind of Delhi history. Uh, mm. You know, in, in journalism, we call it Delhi news. Uh, even in journalism, this happens, that the perspective of the country, you, you imagine Delhi as the center and everything else is regional. And I think mm. this is one of the things that you have challenged, the idea of, uh, of regional kingdoms, of regional heroes, Heroes, and you question why they're called regional. Uh, you know, who, who plays Delhi at the heart or the center uh, of the storytelling of our civilization? So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. See, I mean, popularly, the, the popular narrative of Indian historiography has been, you know, there, there was never a nation. We were actually uh, given this idea of a nation itself after the probably the British came or whatever. Some say the Mughals gave us that idea. So when that, if, if that is true, then this cannot be true. Uh, what is a mainstream then if there was no nation? Uh, and how can Delhi then be the center of the universe? Uh, barring maybe the Khiljis who, uh, you know, had quite a large expanse, the Delhi Sultanate uh, in 500 years of its existence was largely shrunk in and around, uh, you know, little parts of uh, northern India. So vast swathes of land of this country, the south of India, never gets its due uh, in uh, the larger narrative of India. The northeast never features. We don't even know who are the rulers and dynasties and peoples and tribes of the northeast. Uh, the west India, western India too, I mean, the, the Marathas, if you look at the current, uh, you know, NCRT history textbooks too, uh, the kind of in commensurate coverage that is given to Delhi and the little, little dynasties which had very little contribution, in my view, to the larger civilizational story of this nation. Uh, they are given in commensurate, uh, you know, coverage. I mean, the, point, the point you make is barring architecture, uh, you question uh, their contribution. Why is that? Why is it that to talk about the, the brave hearts that you have, there is there needs to be a simultaneous uh, 
what's the word diminishing as it were uh, of the sultanate yeah no i uh, in fact i've uh, mentioned even in my prologue that i i'm not for uh, you know one who stands for excision of anyone from the historical narrative you cannot wish away your past uh, in fact even in my state karnataka there is this constant debate that tipu sultan should be uh, removed from the history textbooks and i have on record opposed that saying you know you uh, he is an important mm. part of your history and your uh, students need mm. to know the good and the bad and the ugly and everything about him so just because a party or a, an ideology doesn't like him or likes him you cannot uh, you know give coverage accordingly mm. so talk about everyone but let there be commensurate importance to all regions if you're calling it the history of india it needs to be an inclusive history how does a student from the northeast who comes to study in delhi uh, you know in the midst of all the mughal architecture there in his in his or her history textbook there she probably doesn't even know read about her uh, the ahoms who came from her place or the meti rulers of manipur or so on so what sort of a uh, country are you building in the process that her story doesn't matter in the national narrative uh, likewise so many i mean the vijayanagar empire probably gets uh, half a paragraph in today's N ncert textbook uh, you know chhatrapati shivaji maharaj gets all but a photograph uh, and a caption beneath that is that what you want a young uh, indian child to know and read about the history of their land uh, while you have three chapters on the mughals i'm not saying don't have them but you know make it commensurate make it equal to all of this grand narrative of the great mughals uh, that that is being uh, you know built so assiduously over so many uh, decades i think that needs contestation uh, and how do you call the cholas as regional what is regional about the cholas they had an empire which went up to sri vijaya and maldives and sri lanka the malay peninsula up to the indo gangetic plains they brought the water from the ganga and called it gangai konda cholapuram uh, so you call them a regional history of some chota sa region in uh, distant tamil nadu which as you said uh, tyranny of distance from delhi so it just doesn't matter to us so But i think these Well, yeah. different voices need uh, are, are screaming for to be heard from different parts of india but talking talking about the cholas uh, and 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 of course uh, you know your you, they do they do figure in your new book uh, how do you separate the politics you know mani ratnam's blockbuster uh, has 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 brought actually national attention to the cholas in, in a way maybe the history textbooks wouldn't but then you've seen this this ferocious contestation you've seen actors like kamal hassan wade into this debate and say the cholas were not hindu you've seen uh, the dmk saying this is a cultural appropriation uh, by the bjp uh, and and how do you see this Uh, unfortunately i think my discipline <laughs> is so uh, weaponized and uh, politicized that i think any objective assessment of it becomes almost uh, you know impossible uh, i would call that a complete bogus argument uh, barkha i mean this whole the cholas were not hindus and so on i mean uh, the most gigantic temples brahadeshwara temple uh, which stands uh, you know thousand year old temple for lord shiva that the uh, raja raja chola built in 1000 ce Uh, if that is not hindu then what is you know just because i mean the names might have changed over uh, you know decades till the time oxygen was Uh, discovered and uh, you know named so what were people breathing uh, so you know it's uh, these kind of semantics it's just a attempt to i mean this larger global narrative that's been going you know this uh, you know nefarious conference that was held last year dismantling global hindutva uh, where at the end of the three days on the one hand it started with this very tall promise that hinduism and hindutva are different uh, and so on but by the end of the three days if you noticed all the characters who were part of it uh, came down to the view that you cannot dismantle hindutva unless you dismantle hinduism uh, so uh, it, so the it, it seems like this larger story that hinduism itself needs to be somewhere delegitimized uh, dehumanized and broken into so many segments because first of all the sanatan dharma or hinduism as we know it has had multiple shades you have the vedic uh, you know core you also have the tantric core which is at complete odds with what the vedic rituals do you have shamanic rituals you have Uh, you know pagan and animist uh, sort of rituals you even have nirishwarvad and uh, the philosophy of charvak and uh, you know uh, and atheism as we may call it also being a part of the fold so today i think the attempt is this big omnibus that hinduism is to break it into these segments and say this part is not part of hinduism each part is you know you say you discredit it delegitimize it and then you have only the vedic core 
and yeah. that is always attacked anyway with the usual you know yeah. brahminism and caste and all these other but but, uh, but but vikram you know i mean i didn't i didn't follow this uh, this global conference that you refer to in terms of what was said and what was not said i i only read about it uh, you know online and saw all the debates that went back and forth uh, but people uh, who who support that conference might say to you uh, that vikram you're looking at history through the prism of hindutva uh, that that history if 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 their perspective is ideological so is yours and i guess that's the question can you divorce you know it is in in a way history is a science you're looking at material and you are uh, there is a sort of hypothesis or a narrative that is built around it and you, you you use the material to to amplify or provide evidence for for that working theory so what do you say to those who would say that when you talk about the cholas uh, when you talk about the civilizational resistance when you speak about a uh, sort of an over emphasis on the moguls you are coming from a place of your ideology which is soft on hindutva i mean you heard this before about yourself well yes i mean uh, uh, i i really don't have any ideological tilt but be it as it may uh, you know how labels are always put on people at least in this book barkha i mean i've tried to balance it with uh, one of course the gender balance you know the yes eight, a lot of women in the book yes seven women who don't again feature in the thing uh, in the larger narrative of india and uh, also i mean uh, there's chand bibi there there's begum hazrat mahal there there's banda singh bahadur there so i mean um, uh, what hindutva did they follow so it's very easy to you know brush anybody whom you don't agree with or, or you want to discredit in some way saying oh this is hindutva you know i mean as if that's a cuss word it's sadly made into that i mean uh, hindutva is the essence of being hindu and i'm very but proud it's a political word it's not a cuss word but do you see it as a political word at least it's Both a political it's word no i mean see that you are in the us right now just see the debates in among the so called academic turned activists there uh, where every day there's a there's an attack on uh, you know you weaponizing this term uh, uh, you know hindutva itself uh, organizations like the hindu american foundation and so on whom you met they've uh, led uh, very very uh, you know strong resistance against the kind of abuse of this word and it has become a cuss word in the larger this one where you you can discredit anyone by just putting this label on them without understanding so what is hindutva what what have uh, has a person need to do to be called hindutva so you know uh, that sort of a thing is uh, is very rife today it's a, it's a it's a running narrative across the world okay um let me ask you this what unites the 15 hmm. brave hearts in your book what unites them i think this undying spirit of uh, you know it could be the human spirit or the civilizational spirit or whatever it is of courage in the face of all odds each one of them i think were faced with very difficult circumstances some of them came from extremely humble backgrounds they're not even born into royalty uh, people like lachit borpokon of assam or kanho ji angre in maharashtra uh, even ahilya bai holkar who came from very uh, humble uh, you know backgrounds but it was sheer dint of uh, you know the the never say die spirit and courage and this uh, feeling that we will do everything till the very end of our lives to safeguard our honor our faiths and our lands uh, and everything our, and our people and their lives so i think that is one common thread which i see among all these 15 people mm. now when you talk about civilizational resistance you know uh, history uh, there is a kind of decolonization churn that india is in the midst of and i am confused about how far this should go because as you said the excision of history is impossible and countries are continuously shaped and reshaped by everything that they go through right um we are seeing reflected in current politics an attempt at decolonization by for example uh, changing the names of cities or towns uh, today we see a debate around english the language in which you and i are having this conversation uh, there is a set of recommendations by a parliamentary panel that doesn't actually impose hindi on the south i think the media actually got that wrong it actually seeks to question the primacy of english which i disagree with because i think it's a great global asset for indians everywhere in the world but it is framed in the context of colonization so that even uh, critics of this government people like yogendra yadav for example have looked at this and said you know we need to reexamine the premium that we placed on english how do you look at this the language debate in the context of sort of history and and challenging colonialism yeah in fact some of the heroes in this book they spoke 
मल्टीपल लैंग्वेजेस चांद भी भी न्यू सेवन लैंग्वेजेस वेलू नचियार फ्रॉम शिवगंगा शी कॉन्वर्स इन फ्लुएंट उर्दू विथ हैदर अली शी वेंट टू फ्रांस एट द पीक ऑफ द फ्रेंच रेवल्यूशन शी न्यू फ्रेंच शी न्यू इंग्लिश सो आई थिंक लैंग्वेज अगेन हैज बीन वेपनाइज टू सच एन एक्सटेंट दैट इट्स कॉजिंग सो मच ऑफ डिविजन अमंग पीपल एंड यू नो इन इन ऑल इट्स द राइट विजडम आई थिंक वी हैड दिस three language formula uh, you know of english and hindi as being official languages and also the regional and we've been formed on linguistic basis all the states uh, but i think barkat to some extent the, uh, the 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 typical as someone who comes from the south of india uh, i do understand the angst that many people from this part of the country have of so many people uh, you know people from the not northern part or other parts of india who come here for employment of other reasons uh, there's a, there's a certain disdain towards the local language uh, you know for people who have lived in bangalore for 20 years and all they probably learn is kannada gottilla uh, you know i don't know how to speak kannada but then you would expect even your house help or the local shopkeeper or the auto driver to con- converse in uh, with you in hindi which is not his or her language of convenience or their mother tongue it's almost well, a shock english how do we see english hindi i get i get the hindi fault line but english yeah, english is to i i am not uh, the anti english uh, brigade at all i think it's an excellent uh, link language and as you said it's also uh, you know uh, undermines or it it really uh, has given india the advantage on the global mm-hmm. scene uh, uh, and we should not dispense with that but i think simultaneously uh, an attempt to ensure that Uh, like the new education policy i think does about education uh, in the regional languages of india uh, also needs to be simultaneously encouraged but there the other flip side is you've had this whole thing of uh, you know medical books uh, written in hindi recently uh, okay if if all the medical education is happening in tamil uh, will the government of tamil nadu uh, assure that everyone passing out of that is given an employment within only that state because that person would be largely unemployable maybe in madhya pradesh or manipur uh, so if everything that he has studied is only in tamil or in kannada or whichever else so i think while the local languages need to be uh, certainly you know uh, enhanced for that there needs to be technical vocabulary that needs to be created how do you uh, enhance a language uh, you know you can't teach engineering and science in kannada and telugu and bengali and so on if there are no term terminologies itself created uh, in those languages new literature needs to come up i think our languages need to thrive but not at the altar of uh, you know having english uh, as a as a major source connecting all of us and hindi is just one another link language which probably connects large uh, number of indians with large number of indians within the country uh, so, so so the three language formula in the way that we have known it is possibly the best one uh, to yes, move but forward yeah, you know the the uh, in south india it was actually followed by i mean even my mother i remember she had done these days to be dakshin bharat hindi prachar sabhas where which used to conduct uh, exams in hindi for non hindi speakers and i had also taken hindi as a subject in class 10 and but 12. because tamil nadu has the two language formula right yeah. it doesn't actually follow the three language and i think large parts of the south hindi would just be resisted um, yeah. but but english yeah, I, i think is here to stay the ideal situation would have been yeah the people in the south who would learn english hindi and their regional language and as a as a goodwill gesture maybe a north indian learns english hindi and pick any one you know tamil or bengali or kannada or whatever yeah. else but there uh, the larger narrative was oh you know tamil if it's almost sound so hard it's like rolling stones in a in a <laughs> in a uh, uh, cup and all of that these were the kind of debates that happened in the 1960s which i think made anna durai say if uh, you know numbers is what count then the crow should be the national uh, bird you know and so <laughs> so <laughs> no, it's fascinating but and i think as you remind us you know uh, the multilingualism would actually be the enviable uh, uh, sort of state in a country as rich and diverse as india but i still want to ask you something you know when you again talk about india the civilization how far back in history should you go and do you go to settle contemporary disagreements the rss chief mohan bhagwat uh, actually said you can't go looking for a shivling under every mosque this is mohan bhagwat's comment i ask you this because literally everything today is contested right there are even petitions in court saying taj mahal ke niche kamron mein kya hai what is in the rooms uh, you know in the in, in, in the dungeons of taj mahal qutub minar is is contested uh, you have of course the gyan vapi uh, sort of case being tried now in court uh, and 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 i just wonder 
how far back do you go to determine who is a hero who is a villain and what should be the correcting sort of filter you know here in the us where i am right now you did have the confederation flags come down uh, you 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 did have statues brought down so it's not that history remains static in any uh, part of the world but how far back do you go as far back as evidence allows you to uh, i mean there's a lot of talk of uh, hindu buddhist strife and that buddhist monuments were um, demolished and if there are uh, there are, there is evidence about that that should that should come out uh, there's nothing wrong in that similarly uh, you know documented in um, you know list of uh, desecration that uh, uh, historian sitaram goel did uh, said at the least the estimate was about 40000 temples uh, were lost uh, in the several waves of iconoclasm and invasions that happened from the middle east now so uh, what do we do about that so if if there is a uh, there, there are sacred spots or sacred sites which are important uh, for a large group of people do we just uh, you know preclude any kind of reclamation even in the face of uh, overwhelming evidence and i think there one of my brave hearts in this book ahilya bai holkar uh, she kind of gives the key so she as a queen of indore she goes around the country reconstructing these desecrated monuments she doesn't go around reconstructing all the 40000 she chooses uh, the important ones she chooses she reconstructs almost all the 12 jyotirlingas she reconstructs the seven uh, you know uh, puris as mentioned in the garud puran uh, the four dhams uh, and that way you know again through culture through spirituality kind of uh, unites the whole nation from shrinagar to rameshwaram from dwarka to kamru the entire uh, water from the ganga is brought down to the south and in uh, to be offered in uh, sacred places in the south and so on so i think uh, it's impossible that in every little place uh, if if we set up those strifes then it could lead to immense social disharmony today so there has to be some Uh, mechanism as to where i mean where there's overwhelming evidence or if there if that particular site is extremely extremely important like we saw in ayodhya and so on uh, then uh, why history also offers this uh, you know uh, justice to your ancestors somewhere and uh, this may not be somewhere uh, you know something that's done to you and me but then this is a reclamation of a historical injustice Well, we leave it there. A fascinating uh, book, a fascinating account you just gave us of Ahilya Bai uh, Holkar, uh, one of the fifteen brave hearts uh, of Bharat, the unsung heroes and heroines. I just want to emphasize the gender there, uh, also because uh, you know women have, in so many ways, even in India's independence movement, only now are we beginning to revisit the women who are at the front line of the uh, struggle for Azadi. Dr. Vikram Sampat, always a pleasure, uh, and I look forward to having you back with us soon. Take care Thank and congratulations you. on the book. Thank you Vikram thank you so much It's great to see you here thank you for watching our work if you haven't subscribed yet don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo story and support independent robust journalism